church. Whether you're here at Rock Island or at Bendorf campus, joining online or Menekewani, I want to welcome all of you. And if you're a guest today, I want to first thank you for sharing this time with us. I encourage you to poke around, get to know us, ask questions. We're going to tell you up front, we're not a perfect church, but we are a passionate church. We're passionate about Jesus. We're passionate about loving God, loving others, and helping each of us live into our purpose. And today, we're actually starting a conversation that'll help us do that more effectively. So if this is your first time here, you picked perfect timing to be part of the beginning of this conversation. But if you've been part of our family and you've been in the journey for a while, you'll see also that this conversation is, has been building off of our previous conversations, all the way back to worth it up to interruptible life. In fact, it was last weekend that we wrapped up our Interruptible Life series, and we were using a graphic to help us understand how to live an interruptible life. It's the idea that there's lots of interruptions that come around us, but we can live a life of faith when we understand our purpose, and we live in a posture of prayer. But there's a bit more to it, because in order to live this life, we need something else. We need the power of God. We need His strength. And today, we're starting a conversation to understand how we get that strength, what it is, and how it connects to prayer. Because quite honestly, prayer is the greatest privilege on earth. Greatest privilege on earth. Yet, yet many people don't understand what it is, what it can do, or how it all works, and end up struggling in the complexity of what prayer can be or should be in a dynamic. But we're going to lean into a conversation that helps us understand what it is, how it works, and, and what it can be. And we can even struggle with how to pray or what to pray. It reminds me of the conversation that took place one day as a woman prepared a meal for a dinner party. She worked all day long, got it all ready, it was beautiful, had the setting, had the guests arrive, they gathered around the table, and as they began to start that process, she turned to her six-year-old daughter and said, sweetheart, would you please say the blessing? And her daughter looked back at her, a little sheepish, a little nervous, even a little bit afraid. She said, I don't know what to pray. But her mom just lovingly looked at her and said, sweetheart, just say what you hear mommy say. So the little girl folded her hands and bowed her head. Dear Lord, why on earth did I invite these people here to dinner tonight? <laughs> Amen. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. But what's worse than that is not praying at all. See, the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. It's a fascinating reality. We don't know what to pray. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, prays on our behalf. In fact, write down Romans 8.26 somewhere. Romans 8.26. You can get to it some other point. Check it out. That's where it specifically says that when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. It's great. It's wonderful because there are times we don't know what to pray or how to pray. There are those moments. But what's worse then those moments is when we don't pray at all. Because when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit can pray on our behalf, but when we don't pray at all, it creates a totally different problem. Because prayer is the link to the power and presence of God in our lives. This is the first feeling, if you want to use your note guide today as we study together the Word, that prayer is the link to the power and presence of God in our lives. It, it's the greatest privilege on earth. I mean, come on, we're talking about having a conversation with God. How awesome is that? It's the greatest privilege on earth, but beyond that, it is the link to the power and presence of God in our lives. It's, it's how we receive what we need to do what He wants us to do. It's how we live an interruptible life. It's how we create embrace space in relationship to other people in that messy middle and complexity. Yet, yet many people fail to experience or know the fullness of what prayer is, and that's a huge problem. Because who we become is determined by how we pray. Who we become in life is determined by how we pray or how we don't pray. Prayer is the link to the power and presence of God in our lives. So I'm going to look at a specific principle as we get started in the conversation. It comes from 2 Timothy. This is Paul writing to his apprentice, Timothy. And here's what he says, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. He says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This is awesome. We don't, we're not given a spirit of fear, but it's self-control and it's love and power. 
power, the ability to step into spaces and have strength beyond ourselves. It's not a superpower. It's better than that. <laughs> it's kind of like a superpower, but it's, it's way cooler. Because this power is the reality that when you and I receive Jesus as Lord, the same spirit that raised him from the dead now lives in us and imparts power to us. And that power has a name. Actually, that power is described in a specific word, a Greek word. And the word is dunamis. Dunamis. Say that with me. Say dunamis. dunamis. Oh, come on. It's a fun word. Say dunamis. dunamis. There you go. Turn to somebody next to you. Look them in the eye. Say dunamis. dunamis. Ben Dorf, get in on this too. Oh, yeah. It's fun. Listen, dunamis. It's a Greek word. It means power. It means mighty work, strength, and miracle. But when you understand the nuances of the fuller definition, we begin to get a picture of what it means when God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but one of power. Here's what the definition is. Inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. It's dunamis power. And it gives us a glimpse in the kind of life we can live in Jesus. But let me tell you, the key is prayer. It's prayer. Look, there are some things in this life that we can do because of a, an identity in Jesus. When we identify ourselves with Jesus, that he is our Lord and Savior, we follow him as, as one of his disciples, our identity gives us the ability to do some things. That identification in him. We can choose not to sin. We can come confidently and boldly before God. We can approach God. Because of that identity in Jesus, we can, res we can resist temptation. We can even represent him in this life, and we can begin to live the interruptible life. When we identify ourselves in Jesus, we can act and move and think in different ways because of our identity in Him as Lord and Savior. That's the reality of the dynamic. But there are some things that require more than identification. They require prayer. Because some things don't happen apart from prayer. And prayer is the link to the power and presence of God in our lives. Now, before we jump into the scripture, I want to be really clear about what we're talking about in this series. We are not talking about acquiring power. We are talking about engaging power. When Jesus is our Lord, he is with us. He is present, and his power is available to us, but we don't always know how to engage it. And we don't know how to engage it. We live a life with limited results. But today, I want to see us position ourselves to watch that change in our lives. To understand how the dunamis power of God works and how it's available to us, along with love and self-control, and not a spirit of fear. Now, we're going to do that by looking in a specific passage of Scripture. It's in Mark chapter 9. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up or click and turn to Mark chapter 9. We're starting in verse 14, and we're picking up in a section of the journey where Jesus has just had this really cool hangout session with Moses and Elijah. I wish I could have been there. That would be so awesome to see that. But he went up on top of a mountain. He took Peter, James, and John, the three disciples that formed the inner circle of the 12 disciples, and he goes up on the mountain with them, and he leaves the other nine behind at the base of the mountain. But when they come back down, when the four come back down, Peter, James, and John with Jesus, they see that there's a crowd gathered around the nine, and they're arguing with the, the, the teachers of the law. And Jesus approaches them, and he says, look, what's going on? Why are you guys arguing? And, and a man responds, said, look, I brought my son here to be healed, but your servants couldn't do it. And Jesus steps up, and he resolves it. And so I want to read this passage. It's just 13 verses, but I want to read it in its entirety. And I want you to just take in the fullness of it, and then we're going to unpack some pieces of it. So Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, so that was the four, Peter, James, and John with Jesus, they came down to the nine disciples. They saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. <laughs> you know, every time I read something like that in Scripture, I love it. Because it just gives us a glimpse into who he was as someone who lived in a space of love and, and, and interruptible life dynamic. And people just ran to him. And he said, what are you arguing with them about? He asked. When they, and a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, 
Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? It's a bit of an awkward moment right now. <laughs> Bring the boy to me. And he, right here, he's demonstrating again the willingness to live an interruptible life, where the interruption can become an opportunity that turns into a divine intervention. So they brought this, so they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and, and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Look, there's this reality in life that we encounter these moments that we try to label can and can't. And, and there's this dynamic of when we have faith and obedience, it leads to some, a divine intervention. We saw this a couple of weeks ago. When we pray, when we talk with God, when we interact with Jesus, his power and presence start to intersect in our lives. And when there is faith and obedience, there is always going to follow a divine intervention. So anytime you see obedience and you see an element of faith, look for the next cool thing to happen. Because faith and obedience lead to divine intervention. And we see obedience in bringing the boy, but now we're about to see faith in this dynamic. Take a look. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. There, this is a great moment of interaction. There's tons of stuff that we can pull out of it, but I simply want to focus on one element, and it has to do with what happens next. Because sometimes it takes more than identification in Jesus for something to happen. See, shortly after this moment, the disciples pull Jesus aside, the nine, and say, hey, Jesus, how, how come you could do that? We couldn't do that. And I think it's not unreasonable to believe that some of them are thinking he would say, well, I'm Jesus, I can do things you can't. But that's not what he said. He actually does something very different. He actually points to an element of failure on their part, an element of a lack of readiness, a lack of preparedness. Take a look at verse 28 with me. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. This kind can come out only by prayer. Now, I have to believe that there is an element of sting in those words. Because I, I believe the implied message was that the nine disciples were not engaged in prayer as they could have been or should have been. That they weren't ready to step into that moment to experience what Jesus wanted to do, what God wanted to do in that moment. That if they had been engaged in prayer like they could have been, they would have been positioned to be part of what God wanted to do in his doing and his power, but they weren't ready. And as a result, had a lack of power. They weren't able to be part of what God wanted to do because prayer is the link to his power and presence in our lives. And because of that, when we're prayerless, we're powerless. When we're prayerless, we're powerless. See, the presence of Jesus changes things. It, it changes moments. Any place that Jesus entered, it changed the dynamic. It changed the dynamic at the bottom of the hill. It changes the dynamic in our life when we encounter him. His presence changes things, but he's not just positioning himself to always be the bearer of power. He wants to impart that power to us so that we can represent him in this world and see the same kinds of change come through us by his dunamis power in and through us. It's not just about him being present. It's about the power that's available to us but a lack of prayer leads to a lack of dunamis power, and a lack of dunamis power leads to a lack of results. And some things just don't happen apart from prayer. Maybe you could say it differently, that, that when we pray, things we thought couldn't happen actually can. They can, by his dunamis power. You know, there's a really great verse that many have memorized in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that reminds us of another key reality. Here's what it says. It says, I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who, th who strengthens me. Many of you know this passage. You're familiar with it. You've memorized it. If you don't know this passage, I encourage you to memorize it. Lay hold of it as truth. Some of you know it by I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or through him who gives me strength. The reality is that there's a, a, a familiarity that comes with this passage, but don't lose the significance of this passage based on the familiarity. 
See, this word right here, strength, strengthens me, is the word in the Greek, endunamao. And endunamao comes from the word endunamo. And dunamo comes from the word, the root word dunamis. So we could really lead, read this passage that I can do all things through Christ who gives me dunamis power. <laughs> he empowers me. You know, sometimes I think with familiar passages, it helps to read them in different translations. And, and the Bible, when it's translated, can be translated word for word, thought for thought, or paraphrase. They're all legitimate. They all have different levels of value for different depth of research and study. But I want to go to a translation called the Amplified Version that is word for word. It's not in your note, God. It's just going to be up here on the screen. But what it does, it's word for word, and it, and it just kind of pulls out and gives layer and depth and texture to what is being declared in Scripture. Just read it with me up here. Just follow along as I read it. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens, empowers me in dunamis power to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Catch that. I love that statement. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That's, that's dependent strength. That's, that's dependent freedom. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength, inner power, and confident peace. It's the reality of dunamis power at work in you and I. We can experience his power at work in us. And he gives us power. So here's the deal. When, when we are not able... When we say we can't, when others notice inability in us and say your servants can't, those moments are a sign of a lack of power and often an indication of a lack of prayer. Because when we're prayerless, we're powerless. A lack of prayer leads to a lack of dunamis power, which leads to a lack of results that create can't moments. Or what we could say are moments when we literally say, I can't. And we've all been there in those moments. We've all been in spaces where in the complexity of it all, we throw our hands in the air like we just don't care, and we go, I'm out. I just can't. I, I, I can't give more grace. I can't forgive again. I, I can't resist temptation any longer. I can't endure, I can't persevere in it. Anytime we get into a space where we're saying, I can't, it's a good indication that we are no longer living in his power by his presence. Not living in his power by his presence. In that space, we can't find joy. We can't find peace. We struggle in the difficulty of life and just say, I can't anymore. The crazy thing is, the reality is that when we pray... Now we intersect the power and presence of God in our lives and everything begins to change. But when we don't pray, we're no longer living in his power by his presence. <laughs> and we can't heal. And we can't recover. And we can't find freedom. Because when we're prayerless, we're powerless. And some things don't happen apart from prayer. Are you tracking this? Okay, listen, I think sometimes we think of God, we look at him, he's like, he's just, he's just the, the giver of some good stuff. He's, he's the resource of some good things. But I gotta tell you, God is not the resource of some good things. He is the source of all good things. And prayer is the conduit. He is, not, he is not just a resource of some good things. He is the source of all good things. And in a world filled with brokenness and pain and loss and hardship, he is the giver of good gifts. Just consider with me the words of the brother of Jesus, James, who wrote at the beginning of his letter in James chapter one, he said this, every good and perfect gift, say every with me, say every, every, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. God, the creator and sustainer of life, is perfect and never changes. His goodness is constant. It never wavers. He is good in every circumstance, in every moment, and his goodness stands alone. He is not good because he does or 
does this or that. He is not good because he doesn't do something else. He is good because he is. And he is good and he is for you. He is good and he is for you. That means that he he will never love you any less. You cannot do anything to make him love you less. He is for you and he is good. On the flip side, you can't do anything to make him love you more (laughs) because he is good and he is for you and he never changes. But I gotta tell you, you may have experiences in life that challenge that where you think, I don't know, is he really for me? I've experienced some pain, some hardship, some loss, some betrayal. And I got to tell you, I've experienced enough pain and loss and hardship in my life that it could give me pause to embrace this reality. But the truth is, he is good. And he is for you. He is good. Now, there's lots of ways that we can know this. There's lots of things in Scripture that can tell us this. But there's one particular thing that helps us really get this more deeply. And it's something that Paul wrote. And he wrote it five verses after he said, when you don't know what to pray... The Holy Spirit's going to pray for you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and in verse 32, here's what he said. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is what? Say that. For us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? All things. Listen, the Father has already given the ultimate gift in the Son. Why would we not believe that he's willing to give us other gifts, smaller gifts? He's already given the ultimate one. God is not a harsh, cruel deity who is not willing to help us be who he wants us to be or help us do what he wants us to do. He is good and he is for you. He wants to see your success. He wants to see your joy. He wants you to live into the fullness of life and to experience the best in this life. He wants you to experience pleasure. He'll do anything for you to have that, including offer his son. You know, look, I'm a dad. I've got two sons. They're now 18 and 21. But I still remember the day I first met each of them and held them on my forearm with their head in my hand in the hospital. I remember that day like it was yesterday. And in that moment, as I looked in their faces, I loved them. And I would do anything then for them, and I would do anything now for them. I I remember just speaking to them in that moment, saying, I I will care for you, I will defend you, I will comfort you, I'll carry you when you can't continue on. I'll give time, talent, and treasure for you. I want to see you live into the fullness of life that God has for you. I will give my life for you. And if you're a parent, you get this more deeply. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying. You don't have to be a parent to get this and understand the principle. But I got to tell you, if I, as some weak, faulty father, would be willing to do that, how much more do you think God's willing to do for you as a perfect, unchanging God? He doesn't shift or change. He, He is for us. He imparts power to us. He gives his gave his son for us. And when we pray, we can experience his power by his presence. But I gotta tell you, there are things in life that can cause us to struggle with this concept. The pain, the loss, the the brokenness of this world. Like, man, what did God do? Why did he allow that? Why did he orchestrate that? I'm gonna tell you, there's a difference between allowing and orchestrating. God never orchestrates sin, but he does allow sin. And he allows and orchestrates some things in life that can cause us to question if this is real. But I'm going to tell you right now, the evidence and proof that this is real is Jesus. It's Jesus. If he would give his son, if he would send his son, why would he not be for us? Why would he not be willing to give us what we need to do what he wants us to do or to be who he wants us to become? If he would give his son, why would he later turn around and not care about that? That's foolishness. That's lunacy. He does not shift or turn. He is not changing. He is perfect. And if he cared enough then, he cares enough now. (laughs) He cares enough now. Regardless of what your circumstances are. Regardless of the difficulty you face. The pain you've experienced. God is good and he is for you. God is for you. God. 
creator, sustainer of life, his ways higher than our ways, is in present tense, real time, now, today, for an advocate sending his son for you. You. You individually. He gives his power by his presence. So when that happens, when we pray, we experience his power by his presence and can't moments become can. This is the reality of dunamis power, inherent power, his power at work in us. And when we pray, we move things in heaven that begin to move things on earth. But when we don't pray, we run the risk of not being part or missing out on what God's trying to do on earth. And we cannot expect God to fully engage if we're not fully engaged in prayer. Prayer is the link to the power and presence of God in our lives. Now, I want to give a word of caution in this, though. We need to be really vigilant in our pursuit of his presence, to pursue his priorities and his purpose over our priorities and our purposes, and be really careful not to simply seek his power, to seek, to seek the results or the answer or the provision, to be really careful not to seek his power more than his presence or his power without his presence. He is not some supernatural vending machine of good gifts. He is not the resource of some good things. He is the source of all good things, and prayer is the conduit by which that happens. So what do we do with the conversation and this reality of a dunas power? Look, God is for us. He he is for us. The so what for us in this is that he is our biggest fan. He is not just a fan. He's the biggest fan. He's champion. He's defender. He's advocate. He will fight for us. There is power in his presence. And if you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, you don't have his power or his presence at the fullness that he wants to extend it to you. But if you want to experience that, all you need to do is have a moment of prayer where you ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior. And invite him in and authority into your life to wash away the junk and let him rule and lead your life. And now you begin to experience the power and presence of God in a new way. In the back of the note guide is an example of that prayer. And you can pray that right where you're at. It's where the power and presence of God begin to intersect our lives. When we pray that prayer, Jesus becomes Lord and there is power in his presence. It connects power and presence in our lives. So here's the question because I understand that who we become is determined by how we pray. Here's the question I want to leave for you that you can process this week on your own. What's not happening because you're not praying? What's not happening because you're not praying? Where are you living without dunamis power? Where, where are you stepping into spaces where you're saying and finding yourself more and more saying, I can't, that you just can't continue? What, what's not happening because you're not praying? You, you don't, we're not positioned. We don't have to live with fear or powerlessness. We can actually live in confidence and incredible power. When we understand that God is good and he is for us and we're willing to engage in prayer in a way where the power and presence of God intersect in our lives, what's not happening because you're not praying? Maybe, maybe you feel powerless in your marriage. Maybe you feel powerless to change a family dynamic. Perhaps you have relationships at work or home and there's patterns of interaction that you feel powerless to break. What's not happening because you're not praying? Maybe your spouse does not share your faith and you've been praying that God would change them. What would happen if you would pray that God would change you? That God would give you his dunamis power and equip you and empower you to be who you're supposed to be and do, who you're, do what you're supposed to do in those spaces. In fact, here's, here's the challenge I actually want to give to us today. I, I dare you to pray a prayer to God asking for dunamis power for 29 days straight. To every day ask God to fill you with dunamis power, to equip you and empower you. A prayer for 29 days straight where you offer up the I can't thing in your life. The thing that you're tempted to say, I just can't. We ask him to move. You ask him to fill you. You ask him to heal. 29 days straight, ask him to fill you with his dunamis power. I dare you to do that. I double dog dare you to do that. (laughs) Because I guarantee he'll show up and move in his dunamis power. 
And we can do this. We can confidently come before him. We know this from lots of things in scripture, but John, the disciple John, one of the guys up on the mountain, came back down. Here's what he said. He wrote this. He said, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We can approach him and we can ask. We can pray and experience his presence and his power according to his will. When, when, when Paul wrote, the Holy Spirit will pray on your behalf and you don't know what to pray, he said, in accordance with God's will. And in the same way, when we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, I want your will. I want your purpose. I want to see your power in, your, in my life. Please move and do in his power. He hears and he responds. I dare you to pray for 29 days. The reason I'm saying 29 days is, a, is to be a reminder of what Jesus said in Mark 9, verse 29. Because that's where he said some things don't happen apart from prayer. So pray. It's the greatest privilege on earth to come before the Father and to ask. And he is for you. But again, I want to caution you. God does not only move by prayer, but I'm going to tell you, prayer is the primary catalyst by which he moves. But when you come before him in prayer, be careful not to seek his power more than his presence. If you're seeking the answer, if you're seeking the provision more than him, you'll find neither. But if you seek him, the answers will come. The power will come. And in quite all honesty, your questions will start to change. Things you once thought were real, significant questions will no longer be. Because when you're in his presence, your perspective changes. You're changed. The presence of Jesus changes things. And his power at work in us positions us to see things we never thought possible. Prayer is the link to the power and presence of God. He's not a resource. He is the source. But some things don't happen apart from prayer. And I, I don't ever want us to be a church that's like the nine disciples who, who weren't ready, who were out of position. I want us to, instead to be a people who are ready when God moves and positions us to make a difference in this world by his dunamis power that we're ready. But that will require prayer. And as we continue in the conversation, the dunamis series, we're going to look deeper at how that all works and what it means. But I'm excited to see how the dunamis of power of God will be at work in and through us, in and through you, as we walk this journey together. Because who you become is determined by how you pray. So let's just take a moment now and pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your great love for us not only sent your son so that we can be rescued and we can be redeemed, but we can also be empowered by your dunamis power so that we can approach you in confidence and we can ask, we can ask according to your will and see you respond. Lord, I thank you for that gift, greatest privilege on earth. I pray that as, as we as a people lean into understanding the dunamis power you make available to us by your spirit, that we would be ready and willing, that we would be receptive, that we would be a people who prioritize prayer and that we'd experience your power by your presence. Help my brothers and sisters know where that plays out, how that plays out in their life, and to really begin for each of us to understand what's not happening because we're not praying. And may you find us in response, getting on our knees and seeking your presence and you pouring out your power through us changing things for your glory. I love you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.